Thank you. Good afternoon. So this is uh, the outline for today and tomorrow. Um, I have an introduction just to try to do a little bit of justice to uh, what has been a long road uh, in the construction of this incredible machine and the uh, two proton proton experiments. That also means that I will not cover LHCB and ALICE in, this, in these uh, lectures. In other words, I will not talk about the dedicated piece of this program or about the heavy ion collision. I will concentrate on the, uh, the frontier, so to speak. And that's basically the studies of uh, electroweak symmetry breaking, in other words, the Higgs and the Higgs and Susie. Obviously, supersymmetry, Susie itself, all this particle searches and so on. And then the other uh, possible new physics that might be out there, like extra dimensions and so on. I'll also tell you about the, uh, uh, the physics of the LHC upgrade. Now, I know it sounds uh, a little strange that one is talking about the upgrade, but given the time scales that are involved in these projects, one really has to, um, to think about things way in advance and sort of uh, decide even now where we think the limit of some measurements will be and what is the best possible next step. And that's what I'm referring to as LHC plus plus. And then finally, I have some. Um, this is, just, just to start us off, we know that basically, in the form of the standard model, we have a theory, a true theory, that has come out of LEP, a huge winner. It has basically become a theory that has been tested to the per mil level. Following the decade, and all the measurements, the precision measurements that were made at LEP, what we have is something that we reached where QED was right basically at the end of the 70s. It was a theory whereby as the experiment following, you know, also the discovery of the Epsilon and so on and so on. We now have something which is basically at the same stature. And you all know as well that despite its huge successes, there's a number of things that doesn't tell us about why the three generations Gravity is nowhere near in the picture except perhaps in these scenarii with the uh, extra dimensions and so on. So we have come to call all of this an effective theory, a very effective uh, theory indeed to say the least. But basically, right now, with the exception of adding supersymmetry, it is the most powerful thing we actually have in hand today. So it's something not to forget because you will get inundated in the next two hours that uh, you'll be spending with me, with a ton of, of, of different uh, signatures, if this happens and if that happens and so on and so on. These are all basically extensions or what we think might be out there. But the reality is right now that what we have is a theory that experimentally addresses everything we have seen so far, with the exception of the, of the cosmos and the uh, dark energy and so on. To come back to the standard model, there is one remaining piece that has not been explored, however, despite all these successes, and that's basically that we need to find the Higgs. We need to find what we think is the way in which the symmetry is broken, in which the photon ends up having a mass of zero, and the W and Z having masses 80 and 90 times that of the proton. Or, if it's not the Higgs that's out there, what else it is that actually brings in symmetry break. If we look actually at what are the big questions right now, they say that uh, the biggest problem with the standard model is, is that it has too many parameters. There's 19 and following the neutrino sector we are now up to 26. There are basically the three couplings of the three interactions. There's a two parameters from the Higgs potential, uh, the vacuum expectation value in lambda, or you can turn that around to mz and mh. There is a fermion masses, three mixing angles, plus one phase in the CKM matrix, and uh, this many more for the leptonic sector, and of course, theta QCD. Interestingly enough, the physics of the LHC, as we expect it today, is not going to probe actually any of these, with the exception of the second line, which is the parameters of the Higgs potential. All the other information we think we're going to get in this 
huge soup of unknowns or mysteries is going to be indirect. But the most direct one is going to be the scale here, the V. And then if we ever get to observe multi-Higgs production, we can get to the self-coupling as well, the lambda. Now, you know that what is the problem? The problem is the naturalness is the fact that the mass scale V is so low, it's at 250 GV, and it is very, very much smaller than one of the square root of G Newton, the Planck scale. And of course, we also know that if indeed the, this V is the result of a scalar particle, because of its self-interactions, the mass would just blow up. It would go uh, quadratically with the scale lambda at which you, uh, you cut off your integral. And therefore, we have a problem, that we have a solution for all of this, which is the Higgs. It's a guy who brings in the symmetry breaking. But on the other hand, its own couplings would just blow him up and take him to the Planck scale. There are ways out of this. And one is a possibility that we don't have a Higgs, which is a fundamental scalar, but in, instead a composite particle. And that would come out of dynamical symmetry breaking. And, of course, the other possibility is to bring in the ultimate stabilizer, that is supersymmetry. This part here is really what the physics of the 1TV, of the physics at LHC, is going to give us for sure. It will answer some of the questions. It's a machine that's been conceived for electroweak symmetry breaking, in other words. And, in fact, we must not forget, we must not forget that there was another machine that was conceived to do this job. It was a superconducting super collider many years ago. It was going to operate at 40 TV in a brand new tunnel, and, well, unfortunately, it did not come to be. Instead, the second solution was to use an existing tunnel, which is at LEP. This is a picture from, from CERN, basically, this is Lake Geneva. CERN is actually right here, this is the oldest PS ring. This is a very old picture from 1985, and it shows a cross-section as a function of the mass of the Higgs. This area, the dark thing, is, is no longer uh, uh, true simply uh, because it, it, it gets affected by the mass of the top, and we know nowadays the top is at 175. This is a cross-section for 4.0 TeV. This is a cross-section for 10. And you see that at the highest allowed masses of about the TeV, a factor of four in energy corresponds to about two orders of magnitude in cross-section. So really, the machine to do the physics of the 1 TV is a 40 TV machine, which unfortunately cannot be built because it costs too much money. So therefore, we have to opt now for this one, but then it means that we have to make up for a difference of about a factor 100 in cross-section. And that you can only do by increasing the luminosity. What is a 1 TV collision? Roughly speaking, you have a quark from each side, say, that uh, comes in with about a sixth of the uh, proton momentum. You have a collision that, if you want to produce something like a very heavy Higgs, would come out of vector boson fusion, WW. So if this guy is 1 TV, these are 500 GeV. The quark here is, say, roughly half of that, and therefore you end up with these guys being about 1 TV. And therefore you need a proton of about 6 TV. That's about the minimum where you go if you're going to have any kind of counting rate in the experiment. So all you see is a proton-proton collider with energy for each proton of about of 7 TeV. And this limit is given by the magnets. They can actually drive this up to 7.5 if they go to absolute full current. Because of the incredible luminosity that needs to be achieved in order to account for the fact 100 smaller in cross-section, the machine is extremely difficult. In fact, there are many bunches that are running. If these are bunches of protons and these are bunches of protons in the other direction, there's 3,600 bunches which are running in the machine. It's a 27 kilometer machine, 3,600 bunches. That means that there's about seven and a half meters between it, each bunch. That translates to 25 nanoseconds between bunch crosses. It's an unprecedented high rate of interactions, and these bunches as well are very, very high. To, cut, to put it in perspective, if one takes a total inelastic cross-section at the LHC and compares that to the cross-section for a Higgs, which is at the limit of where it left, left us, the selection which is required in order to find things is about one event in 10 trillion. That's the kind 
of rare process <coughs> what we're looking at. Just to drive the point home, this is the place to write down that the cross section is, uh, you know, uh, 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 a function of the partonic cross section and the structure functions and so on. We know that uh, uh, at a hadron collider, we do not abide to the fact that uh, uh, we have sigma one over s. So if you wanted to have a factor x in the center of mass energy, uh, you need the factor x squared that's going to come in in the luminosity, simply because the partonic cross the, the, the parton distribution function goes up much, much faster than that. And therefore, the rough rule of thumb is that the factor two in square root of s in energy in a hadron collider is equivalent to a factor 10 in luminosity. So if you say that there's about a factor of two and two between 14 TV and 40 TV, we need the factor 100 in luminosity, which is what we recover. Therefore, the full design luminosity has to be 10 to the 34 for the LHC. And what that means, and the low luminosity is 10 to the 33. And what that means is that if you take that luminosity, you multiply it by the total inelastic cross section, 70 millibars, you get a rate of 10 to the 9, almost about a gigahertz, a, a billion interactions per second. You multiply that by the time between bunch crossings, and you get to the fact that that means that on every crossing there will be 18 interactions, mean. Now, not all of these bunch crossings are full because of technicalities that have to do with the injection and so on, and only three quarters of, of them are alive, so therefore you have to multiply by four thirds and you arrive at the number of 23, which means that the golden Higgs event that we're looking for is going to be buried inside 20 other minimum bias events, and it will look like this. This is the guy you're looking for, and this is actually the golden signature. This is a Higgs that has gone into two Zs and subsequently decayed into two muons. And it's super clean because we have applied a transverse momentum cut of 25 GV. This, however, is what the detector will register because in addition to this event, the golden one, there's 20 minimum bias events which are overlaid at different points here. The luminous region is about 6 centimeters. It's not as long as at the terrestrial. And this repeats itself every 25 nanoseconds. Well, that, not this. This is inside. I have to spend three minutes on the detectors just because it, it, it has been a long road. The impact of that picture that you saw is basically that first, they must have very fast response because 25 nanoseconds later, there's the next interaction. That means that every signal has to be very, very fast. The typical response time of the detectors is 20 to 50 nanoseconds. Now you know perhaps from other experiments that this is sometimes an order of magnitude faster than many of the detecting elements that we have. The other thing is that the detectors have to be very granular. You cannot have a basic element which is large simply because you need to be able to make out the various hits here. So you need to have a very, very high, you need to minimize the probability that the pileup, as we call it, affect the main, you know, just wash away the main signal. And finally, you have to be exceedingly radiation resistant because you have a very high flux of particles that are coming out. And that corresponds to a very high radiation environment, which in 10 years of LHC operation correspond to 10 to the 17 neutrons per square centimeter. It's about 10 to the 7 G, where a G is a joule per kilogram, which is about a thousand times what you can absorb from your portable phone. So there's been two detectors. They've been designed with precise, with the exact opposite philosophies. This detector is CMS. It has a solenoid, so in the RZ plane, you get straight tracks. In the uh, plane of the interaction, you get bending, and then once you go through the iron, you bend in the opposite direction. This detector is Atlas, and what they have is toroids, so basically all the bending for the muons takes place outside of the inner detector. So you get straight tracks here, and then the toroid takes over and bends the tracks. Now that would make it look like a, an experiment that does not have an inside, in, an inner magnetic field. So it would make it look like UA2 and the old D0. And for this reason, there's an extra magnet here, a solenoid, to provide the magnetic field inside. So in brief, they can now measure both the inside and the outside momentum. 
This is it. This is Atlas. It's a gigantic thing. It's 7,000 tons. It's 70 meters. And here is the usual G4 person, the Jan 4 person, just to give you the scale for things. And here is CMS. I will not spend more time. Just to put it in perspective, these are the experiments that were being designed for the SSC. These, this is from very, very old transparency. Sorry, this is the best the scanner could do. This is the size of Atlas and this is the size of CMS. This is just to give you an impression for what I told you about the fast signals and the many, many challenges that have had to be solved. Since light only travels at uh, the speed it does, what it means is that in 25 nanoseconds, it only goes to seven and a half meters. So anybody who comes out of the interaction point goes seven and a half meters. So this is a first circle of seven and a half. This is 15 meters, this is 21. What this picture is telling you is that as the particles are coming out of the interaction, actually these muon chambers are registering three interactions earlier when in fact the inside part of the detector is actually seeing interactions that are occurring now. And of course there's a sine theta dependence for all of this. And of course in addition to this there's the mundane practicalities of the length of the fiber and the propagation of the signal because somebody's got to send a clock to all these guys and there's about 20 million channels, and you have to clock it at the right time. It has been actually a very, very long process to construct the detectors. It's not finished, but it's actually uh, uh, getting there. Now, what about the physics? Because you make these detectors in order to get to the physics. This is a cross-section. This is square root of energy. This is where we're going to sit. This is a total cross-section over here. This is a rate on the right-hand side for nominal luminosity. Inelastic cross-section is 10 to the 9 hertz. W to lepton neutrino is 100 hertz. In one second, there's 100 Ws. To put it in perspective, at the end of UA1 and UA2, the total sample was 164. Okay. Top production is 10 hertz, so it's justifiably called actually a top factory, the LHC. Higgs at 100 GV is a tenth of a hertz, and at the highest masses, it's a, a bit more than a millihertz. The selection needed, as I said, is roughly 1 in 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11. The thing is that um, this process has to happen basically mostly online. It cannot be done offline, and that's another burden that we have when we turn on what we will have to do is, there's no way that you can take this gigahertz rate, this is the same plot as before with various signals. There's no way you can go from the gigahertz down to about 100 events per second that you can afford to write. So what you need to do is you need to provide the rejection factor online of about a million. So to put it in perspective, out of every million events that we will see, we will write roughly one. And that translates to about 100 events per second, and at that point, the physics begins. Okay, now, the LHC is actually coming, and this is actually a photo, and this is actually a person who's working on the magnet. And the main thing is that the, uh, the, the, the main problem with the machine, the main issue with the machine has been the production of the dipoles and the installation. You can actually go to this uh, page uh, uh, on the web and follow the, uh, the so-called uh, dashboard for the LHC. <coughs> Knock on wood right now, it's on schedule, as you can observe from actually looking at the just-in-time and the curve roger, the, the performance versus that which was expected. There's a new schedule which was just announced by the CERN Council, which now says that uh, the experiments have to close in August, uh, end of August of 07. Uh, about six weeks later, uh, we have to close and be ready for the co we have to be ready for collisions. And the first collisions will occur somewhere in November, and they will be at injection energy only at 900 GeV. Uh, this is because most of the energy in the machine is coming from going to 14 TeV, and people want to commission things the way uh, 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 with the same parameters as a Tevatron, which is a known machine, and therefore there is some operational experience. There's a lot of Fermi lab people who are involved in this. Now, this of course means that it will operate at an energy which is even lower than the Tevatron, so it will not be a discovery machine for the first couple of months. There's now discussions on how to move to higher uh, energies, perhaps to imitate the Tevatron for a couple of months, 1.8 TV or 2 TV, if this can be done, and then eventually to have the first physics run in 
era, in 2008, and that should give us about a few inverse femtobars. The experiments are being constructed. There's huge progress which has been made, and this is just a couple of pictures. This is from Atlas, this is from CMS, and these are cosmics which are registered. That's why they're back to back, because cosmics go straight through. There's no magnetic field. If you look at the startup in 2008 now, and this is weeks, what I have here is the instantaneous luminosity. This is the total integrated luminosity in a certain optimistic scenario. One would be rediscovering the top, one would have enough statistics to rediscover the top with hundreds of events uh, after about week three. A, a signal, an early signal from a TV extra Z prime would appear roughly in two and a half months. And SUSY is relevant throughout the entire period because low mass SUSY of about 500 GeV particles has enough cross section that this is actually can show up very, very early. And then finally, at the end of this 2008 run, perhaps there's enough statistics to exclude the hits over most of the allowed region. So the menu says that in a year's operation, we're basically able to cover, to answer most of today's questions that are related to electroweak symmetry grade, and in particular to the standard model case. For the, for the hits, let me tell you that you know that uh, we only have theoretical arguments for limits for it, lower mass limits and higher mass limits. And the one that's become uh, uh, most visible after the, the discovery of the top and the measurement of its mass is the fact that the self cup here is the, uh, uh, the uh, loop corrections to the potential, the Higgs potential. And you can have the Higgs running here because remember you have the four point vertex. Or you can have fermions or Ws and Zs. And the contributions go in with opposite signs. And what you observe is they are proportional to mass to the fourth, and that's why a large top mass means that after a certain point, you can take this Higgs potential, and you need this minimum, remember, to have the symmetry breaking, and you can curve it back down for very large top masses. Now, this would, of course, be a disaster because it means that the standard model Higgs mechanism would not function. And since the, uh, what it means that we have to balance this guy, the mass of the Higgs, versus the mass of the top, and that, of course, translates to a limit. If you put all the limits together, we have also the electroweak uh, precision measurements from lead, vacuum stability, and the triviality bound. Triviality bound simply, this is true for any uh, uh, fine to the fourth uh, scalar field. It simply has to do with the fact with the evolution of the coupling constant. You end up here with the mass of the, I don't know, but this thing has a certain hysteresis. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm going to switch to the, uh, not even the mass. Okay, so in the plot on the right hand side, what you have is a mass of the Higgs on the y axis here. This is 100, 200, 300. And this is log lambda, where lambda is the high mass scale. So this would be one t in GeV. This is one TeV, this is uh, 100 TeV, and so on. This would be the world where we are right now. These are the regions which are excluded, and that's the white is where the Higgs is allowed to show up, which is why we say that currently what we favor is a light Higgs, as you heard, and most likely lighter than 215 GV. How is it produced? Well, the biggest production mechanism is gluon gluon fusion, a top triangle, because of the very large coupling between the Higgs and the top, since it couples to mass of the top squared. And then what you also have is TT bar fusion, WZ Bremsstrahlung, and then eventually WW and ZZ fusion. Here is the cross section as a function of the mass of the Higgs. The gluon gluon fusion diagram always dominates, but then the uh, this thing here, the forward production, we call it forward production for because the two quarks they go here very forward, and this W or Z fusion diagram leads to a Higgs. This eventually comes at the very, very highest masses to the same cross-section as the gluon-gluon fusion. This is the diagram that I used in order to say that we need about six or seven TeV proton collisions in order to see the Higgs. What about the decays? Well, it depends on the mass. This is a branching fraction as a function of the mass. This is 100 GeV, 200, and this is one TeV. And it, since it couples to the fermions and the coupling is proportional to the mass squared, 
It means that it is completely dominated by VD bar decays up to the point where suddenly you open up the threshold for W. W decays, eventually for Z, Z decays. By the time you open the TT bar threshold at 350 GV, it's too late because the coupling to Ws and Zs is always maximal, so it does prefer to go to WV and then to top. So in brief, the signatures are BD bar, WW, ZZ, and this guy here, which is actually quite difficult to disentangle at the LHC. This means jets, and jets are measured with a precision of 10 to 15 percent. And that's bad because it means that you'd be trying to see a peak over something, a very broad peak. And for that reason, we look for decay modes which are going to be electromagnetic. So if you go down the chain, there's tau tau, which is the next heaviest, heavier left, CC bar. Blue blue is here, that would be thankless because that's even more background since you can't even do B tagging. The next thing you have is a thousand times down and it's a diphoton signature. Now that would give you a very narrow peak, but at the price of losing a thousand Higgses every time you want to go for this gamma gamma. In brief, this is how you look for the Higgs depending on the mass range. You, this is a gamma gamma channel at low masses. Intermediate masses, you have W, W, Z, Z, and eventually at the highest masses, it's always a dipole channel. What would it look like? Since this is a rare decay, uh, the Higgs to gamma gamma for masses up to about 140 GV, well, it would look like two photons in the detector. This is the electromagnetic calorimeter. There is no trap pointing to it. This, the blue is a background here, this is the mass of the Higgs, this is where the would-be Higgs would show up at the mass of 130 GV. Don't get fooled by the fact that this is zero suppressed, the number here is 4,000, so the zero is actually down here. This is really a very little dip on top of a very large background. So the big problem in this analysis is going to be to maintain a very high resolution of about 1 GeV. Uh, on a mass of 100 GV. Why? In order to make this thing as narrow as possible. Because if you make it twice as narrow, twice as wide, the amount of background you're going to integrate is going to blow up. So this is a key to this analysis because it's drowning in a very, very large background. At intermediate masses, what you have is, well, the golden decay that we saw earlier. There's a Higgs going to two Zs. Each one goes to two muons. The signature is super clean. You don't need any pattern recognition algorithm to tell you that you see four tracks that, which traverse a full detector, and that corresponds to a beautiful peak that you see here. I'll show you what this beautiful peak will look like in reality, actually, with, with, uh, with a lower luminosity in just a second. At the very, very highest masses where you run out of, of statistics, you uh, can no longer afford to have the two Zs both decay leptonically because you pay a price of 3% for the branching ratio every time. And therefore, you need to allow one of the two to go to jets. And this is what you observe here. Now, the jets are very boosted because they're coming from a, a one, uh, an 800 GeV object, say. And therefore, what it means is that they're all very collimated, which is what you observe in this direction. You have the two muons, and on the other hand, on the other side, the two jets, which are almost overlapping. Of course, the statistics is very low. If you look at the plot, it says four on the left-hand side. So this is really a handful of events at the highest luminosity. The bottom line is that if you look at the significance that you can get out of these searches as a function of the mass of the Higgs, it's given up on me completely. Um, which is what you see on the... Voila. Can you see the mass? All right, good. So this is, on the horizontal axis, the mass of the Higgs, and on the Y axis, the significance with which one can observe it. This number here is 10, ah, the mouse disappears as well. This is not the day. This is 10, this is 1. This would be a discovery, ad hoc, defined as a 5 sigma 1. This, of course, with very, very high luminosity, would correspond to after at least four years of running. And this is a various channel, so this is a Higgs to gamma gamma, this is a BB bar channel, these are the diboson channels, and the red line is of course a total, this comes from Atlas. And you can see that the overall, the, 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 uh, uh, the significance of the signals is going to be huge. You can turn it around and say, how much time do I need? 
if I take these plots, I can translate them into how much instantaneous, how much integrated luminosity I need in order to have the discovery. So this is a discovery luminosity here. This is one inverse phantom arms. And of course, the plot now looks exactly the opposite. The dip that you observe is where the W gives up in exchange for the Z in between 80 and 90 GV. And you see that with about two to three inverse phantom arms, you cover most of the mass range. And then in this narrow range, where the teletron is also relevant, with the WW channel, you can discover it in less than a month, if it happens to be there. Unfortunately, this would be a channel that has no peak, because the Ws would, uh, would be seen by going into the Um This is more recent work. The plots that you see, they come from a long time ago. This is from, from uh, very recent work where, for example, now people are really trying to, to, to do the analysis to the full extent. And what is combined on the right-hand side are decays of the two Zs into four muons, four electrons, two electrons in what do I do with it? Aim and shoot. Okay. Thanks. Um, so this is now putting all four channels together, the four electrons, the four muons, and what you see here is the example of the EE mu mu channel, which has a huge advantage that you don't have combinatoric uh, background because you know that the two E's are one Z and you don't have to wonder about it when you have four muons where all combinations go. This would be the discovery of the E E mu mu mode at a mass right where the two Z threshold is. Just to put it in perspective, this is 17 events and the statistics would look like that. This is actually just a random experiment and the red would be the presumed fit at the time. And with this mode, with a combination of these modes, and after about two years at the low luminosity, you would cover basically most of the range with the exception of this hole right here, where you would need more luminosity in order to be able to do it. A significant drop below five. What about this, this channel here, the, the, the WW, at, at intermediate masses where it goes to two Ws and basically nothing else? At that point, you're hopeless if you try to do it into two jets. So you have to rely into the two leptonic modes of the W, but that means you also have two neutrinos, and therefore you cannot form the invariant mass. Therefore, it's only a counting experiment, and this is the kind of counting that you would have to do. The red is a signal. This is, for example, the angle between the two leptons. Any topological variable will do here. These are the sums of the backgrounds. And of course, the problem will be to convince the world that you know that this is what the background is, and it's not twice as large. Simply because this is a counting experiment now, and you don't have the sidebands to tell you that this is what it is here, this is what it is on the other side, and then between you have an unambiguous signal. So this is, uh, this would be tough to prove, and with one inverse factor bars, this is a kind of statistics. So I repeat, if you know the background, if you can calculate the standard model, or measure it at the experiment, Within a month, you have it. It's locked. But of course, the problem then is not to discover the Higgs, but actually to understand the detector, which is going to take a long time, and it's not mentioned. Two, to measure the standard model. OK, and once you find it, what's the next step? Well, you turn to the properties. You have the mass. The mass, well, again, it depends on, on where it will be measured. But uh, once, it, it, once you go to dye bosons and they go to uh, uh, muon, to muons and electrons, you're basically looking at precisions of about the 0.1% of the mass, about the per mil. Jets, uh, of course, would have an absolute energy scale, which is worse than that. They, uh, okay, I can now. <laughs> <laughs> so, once you, you have the jets that. Uh, <laughs> So you have these guys, the best you can get to a, an absolute jet energy scale is about 1%, and that would be the dominant systematic here. The resolutions are, of course, much worse than that. Uh, the, for gamma gamma and the four leptons are, are, are 1.5 GeV. For BB bar, it would be about 15 GeV at, at very low masses. But of course, with very high statistics, this is not relevant. So basically, you get over the most, the widest mass range, you get to a precision of about the per mil, and then as this rises, you start rising in the precision as well, because the width of the Higgs goes up as mass to the cube. What's the other interesting property? It's couplings. 
it's the guy who couples to mass, so it will be important to establish that you get uh, the square of mass B squared over mass tau, if we can see decays to both B quarks and two tau. So how do you probe those? Basically through ratios. If we have both WW and ZZ, and you take the, the inclusive production via gluon gluon fusion, the ratio of the two basically is just the ratio of width to W to width to Z. Correspondingly, if you have the channel that goes to gamma gamma and the channel that goes to ZZ, you can get the width that goes to gamma over the width that goes to Z, and this would be proportional to gamma W gamma Z. It's basically the combinations depending on what the final decay would be, W, W, Z, Z, and so on. You would always normalize, of course, to a known decay mode. And then these would be the, the, depending on where you sit in mass, you have, we said, the inclusive production mechanism. And this is now decaying to gamma, gamma. So this is now proportional from the production to gamma of gluon times the ratio of gamma, gamma as in capital gamma, sorry. I should say width to the photon over the total width, and that gives you one parameter. Second parameter for the Z, third parameter for the W. From the gluon-gluon fusion, from the W fusion diagrams, you can get correspondingly the same factor on the right-hand side, but the production now comes from the width to the W, the gamma W. It's not the gamma gluon here. Combining those means that you can get an error on basically the couplings defined as always with the ratio with respect to the Z in the absence of QCD corrections, which are roughly 15 to 20 percent over most of the masses of the Higgs. You can also measure the width directly, as uh, we said, and that high masses, you, uh, the, the width would be given simply by the resonance that you observe, up until the lower masses, at that point it just blows up and, and you have a measurement of worse than 10% uh, below about the, the 2 z threshold. It, you can see it better here, the why this is so. This thing here is the experimental resolution, the blue line, as a function of the Higgs mass. This thing here is the theoretical width of the Higgs. So it's very simple. From here upwards, for these masses, the experimental resolution is higher than the width of the particle. So it's very easy to actually measure the width. Below this point, the natural width of the particle is smaller than the detector resolution. So at that point, life becomes tough. There are tricks that one can play there, and for example, if, here's now a futuristic scenario, if we're able to measure all the fractions that I showed you earlier, for example, from the, from the uh, 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 WW fusion diagrams, and therefore we observe the QQ going to QQ two forward quarks and then the two jets that come from the Higgs. If we get all three factors here for J corresponding to the photon, the tau, we need always a photon and the boson and then one fermion. If you get this and we can measure those fractions with a precision of 10 to 30 percent, we can also measure the corresponding fractions from the gluon-gluon production mechanism and here the precision would be worse, 10 to 30 percent, mainly because of the backgrounds. Then you put it all together and you assume that this, what is left after you take out all of these decays, so the decay branching to B, to tau, to W, to Z, to Z, to gamma, and you call that very, very much smaller, you can work it out. You have an indirect measurement of the total width, which could be as good as 10 percent. If it's at high mass, we can also measure the spin. That would be, of course, very important. The analogy is you have a spin zero particle that goes to two spin one and then to the fermions. It's exactly the way you would do it with a pi zero going to gamma gamma and then the two gammas giving you uh, an E plus and minus. So you have the two planes of the decay in the Higgs rest frame and then angular, an angular analysis at high luminosity can actually yield the measurement of the spin. If it doesn't go to two Zs, life is tough. So simple as that. I want to say also a few words about the alternative uh, electroweak uh, symmetry breaking before we uh, move off to the world of Fusi. We know that boson-boson uh, uh, boson scattering actually becomes strong as you increase the energy. And to cut a long story short, a diagram like this one, if you just count 
the number of polarization vectors that you have here, just from the diagram, you have one, two, three, four. Each polarization uh, vector is essentially proportional to the momentum, and therefore, what, when you have four of them, it simply means that you have something that, as far as dimensions go, grows as energy to the fourth, and therefore is S squared. This thing will just grow with energy. Now, actually, because of gauge invariance, it grows only as S, not as S squared. Now, if you add the Higgs diagram here, actually this guy actually is what cancels this infinity, as not infinity, this proportionality with S as S grows. And therefore, this guy is actually needed. And that's why we say that, for example, beyond 1.2 TV, in order to not exceed unitarity, you need to bring in the Higgs. Because beyond 1.2 TV, collisions of WW, at that point, you exceed the total allowed by quantum mechanics. So what do we do? We include in the generators this diagram and we simply let the mass of the Higgs go to infinity. Letting it go to infinity is essentially making it disappear and therefore you don't have the, can the cancellation. So therefore, the question is what would you see at that point? So what you would see is basically an abnormally large WW cross section, except that now this is coming at the highest possible masses of 800 GV or at 1 TV. So this would correspond to WW production, which is higher than expected, and it would look something like this. This is, of course, at the very, very absolute limit of what the current LHC could do. Mass here is 1 TV, 1.2, 1.4. This is just a production of Z plus jets. Remember, one of the two must go into jets, otherwise you don't have enough statistics. And this would be the tiny excess of about 10 to 15 events. And on the basis of that, one would say that the WW cross-section or the WZ cross-section is higher. And therefore, that is, this is what one would expect in this scenario. Uh, more dramatic, actually, would be the obser observation of W plus W plus scattering, uh, whereby you would see an excess. But this is now, for example, the invariant mass of the two leptons and the, uh, uh, you bring in the two neutrinos as well in the transverse mass. The difference between the dashed and solid here and the hashed is the excess. Again, this would be a very, very difficult experiment. One of the, uh, one of the alternatives that is being uh, suggested, that it was suggested actually a long time ago, very early on, was to have a dynamical source for the symmetry breaking, and it found the form of this technicolor. So the idea is that there's a new strong interaction and the Higgs is actually a condensate of two technifermions. They are bound together into some kind of technipion, just much, much like the, the pion itself is a bound state of two quarks. So therefore what you have is that the decay constant of this object would be the vacuum expectation value of the technifermion pair. So in analogy with QCD, the expectation value of QQ bar, which is lambda QCD cubed, here you would have the expectation value of these two fermions to be lambda technical or cubed. And since the mass of the boson from symmetry breaking is G, the coupling constant times the vacuum expectation value V over two, you set the vacuum expectation value to the decay constant and you get to an F, the decay constant for the technipine of about 500 GV. Bon, fine, so this is one possibility. Now, how do fermions get mass in this one? And here you run into the first problem. Which is the only way you can make the fermions get mass is you introduce a four fermion coupling here. So here are the, the uh, two quarks, and then here is the FF bar pair. You introduce some constant lambda, but then of course you count dimensions, and you come up with the fact that the dimension here must be minus two. And therefore, what it means is that the mass of the fermion that will come out of this one, because when this acquires a vacuum expectation value, it simply becomes something proportional to FF bar, so it's a mass. The mass of the fermion is lambda cubed over mass squared. In other words, the bosons that transmit this now must be extended, as we say, simply because now if you, if you set a very high mass scale here, the very high mass scale for the lambda would yield lepton masses which are completely unreasonable. So you need to bring it down. Sorry for this academic parenthesis, but because people say Technicolor is dead, Technicolor is actually not dead, and it's going to be looked for. Now, 
This symmetry simply has to be broken, since the boson would have a mass which is at some mass scale of the extended technical. And then the problem is, is that you need to avoid flavor changing neutral currents. If you're going to avoid those, you better have a mass which is quite large, otherwise a low mass extended technical of boson would transmit flavor changing neutral currents. And what then that yields is a number of possibilities, and people now talk about walking extended technical, whereby you run much slower than you, the expected QCD-like running. What that offers you is the fact that the, uh, the mass scales slower than before, and therefore you don't run into a problem with the limit. An alternative is to have a very large NTC. Another alternative is top color um, that has appeared uh, five years ago. What is the phenomenology here? Is that the technipine and the techni rho resonances would decay into basically the Ws and the Zs. And what you would observe is direct decays to the jets, of course, are possible, but that would be very difficult due to the jet energy resolution. So therefore, one would look for this type of resonances, and these would be examples of uh, of uh, techni rho decay into the equivalent of a pi plus, pi zero for a rho plus. So this would be to a W plus and a Z zero. And all leptonic decay in order to beat the background. And depending on the mass, you would see different peaks. So this scenario has still been made alive. Of course, people argue about whether walking extended technical is, is a way to save it. Nevertheless, the signatures that correspond to the dibosons visible. Let me turn that to the last part that has to do with the Higgses, and this is uh, the Higgses in uh, minimal supersymmetric model. Now the analysis here is very complex because there's five Higgses. There's two charged ones and three neutral ones. There's two CP even ones and one CP odd. At three level, all the masses depend on only two parameters, and we take them uh, to be mass A, of the, the CP odd Higgs in tangent beta. There are modifications to the tree level that come mainly from uh, top loops because the top has a highest <coughs> mass. Now, at tree level, the mass of the smallest Higgs is basically less than mass Z times cosine beta. And therefore, that's why in the old days people thought that uh, the Higgs must be lighter, in Susie, must be lighter than the Z. Now, unfortunately, this this gets uh, modified by the radiative corrections, and the limit in that, uh, in the presence of those, goes to 135 GeV. Now, what we will see depends crucially on what is the mass scale of SUS. In one scenario, you have a mass scale of about 1 TeV, and therefore the Higgses do not decay to SUS particles. That's a well studied scenario, and we will see it here. The other one, is where the SUSI particles are at the same energy scale as the Higgses. So now, who decays to whom is a matter of the exact mass spectrum. Now this, the studies for this one are ongoing. So this is big branch number one. The other big branch in this phenomenology is stop mixing and the value of tangent beta. This is stop, the supersymmetric partner of the top. Now you have two cases. One is maximal stop mixing and the other one is no mixing and the other one is very low masses of values of tangent beta and high values of tangent beta. Do I need to say what tangent beta is in more detail? No. Good. So, these are the masses for the Higgs bosons as a, as a function of MA, and this corresponds to always in the very high mass SUSY uh, scenario, one TV, not GV as it says here, TV and TV, this is no stop mixing, this is maximal stop mixing. These are the charged Higgses. This is mass A. So essentially, it runs proportional to it. This is a little Higgs for a tangent beta of 20, a tangent beta or 2. And you see that it just flattens out after you cross this threshold here of about the Z mass. And this is the limit, which is why we say that it has to be lighter than about 135, which comes here. This is a little Higgs, which would be basically indistinguishable from the standard model Higgs. One can probe, of course, but this guy essentially feels, looks, smells like the standard model Higgs. These guys here now, the big H, is at a mass which is, has a lower limit, which is just above the upper limit, of course, of the little Higgs, 
And then the moment you cross the threshold, it starts rising again. And in fact, at high masses, disentangling here, the A and the H would be very difficult. In fact, they are essentially degenerate. So, what does the production look like? Again, the mechanisms are the same. You always have the gluon gluon fusion diagram. Now, of course, in the loop, you have to add the corresponding high mass SUSY particles. And therefore, you have to add the, the stops and the bottoms and so on. And you always have at your disposal the uh, W, the virtual W and Z that goes into a W and Z and radiates off a little h or a big h, CP even. This is as a function of the cross-section, and this plot, the plots are usually split because on the left-hand side up to the limit, you essentially have the, pr the production for the little h. On the right-hand side, you have the production for the big h. The crucial thing to note here is that right after the inclusive channel, you have a lot of production from associated HBB bar. Where is this coming from? Well, if you look at this production here, so you have the gloom gloom diagram, here is the BB bar production at the, the Tevatron, this is the dominant production mechanism, and then off of here, you radiate, you hit off a, a little H or a big H. This thing is now, the coupling of the Higgs to the B is proportional to tangent beta, and this one is to tangent beta squared. And therefore, what it means is that you get a lot of enhancement at large values of tangent beta. The tangent beta of 30 gives you three orders of magnitude, and therefore, this thing here, this cross-section, HBB bar, the associated production mechanism becomes the dominant one for large values of tangent beta. And in fact, this is why in the plots that we will see, anything that corresponds to large tangent beta can be probed immediately because of the large production cross-section. As for the decays, well, it's the same story as before. At low mass, at a low tangent beta, high tangent beta, this is a little hit. It goes to BB bar, it goes to tau tau, period. The plot stops at, you know, uh, at the limit. This is the MA, this is the mass of, of the A, low tangent beta, high tangent beta. And the difference is that here, BB bar is present only up to where the threshold opens up, and you can even go to things like ZH, associated production. But at large tangent beta, it's just all dominated by BB bar. The corresponding bosonic modes are not there. Uh, I've kept some extra transparencies in case there are questions at the, at the session. So what has been looked at? There's a very extensive set of channels that have been looked at, and here's a, a sample, a, a set of examples of the case. Obviously, there's the gamma gamma and the BB bar channel in association either with TT bar or with WH. One set of very important modes are the uh, three Higgses that decay to tau plus tau minus. These are leptonic modes, and therefore there are all three different signatures for the taus. You have the hadronic hadronic signature, the leptonic leptonic, and the one lepton one hadron. All of these, to the extent that this is actually extremely important, we say that the tau is going to be the lepton of the LHC. If the B was a quark of the tevatron, because B tagging opened up a whole new set of measurements that were not possible in the previous generation experiment, the tau is going to be the new tool for the LHC. And then, further on, there's the other scenario that I talked about, which is direct decays of uh, the Higgses into the SUSY particles. In this case, the gay genus. Now, here's an example from the HA that go to tau tau. And this has been studied for all three channels, as I told you. One can actually get pretty good signals simply because of the large cross-sections. The background here can be reduced by B-tagging because it's produced with two Bs in association. So you use that in order to beat the generic tau-tau production. And the kind of signal separation from the background that one can get is about this. The decay, incidentally, offers a measurement of tangent beta. Albeit, you'll have to need, you need some theoretical input as well. Now, to put it in perspective, in order to get this type of, of plot, one needs to beat the QCD background by a factor of 10 to the 6, because of course QCD jets do fake tau jets. The difference between the two is that tau jets are very narrow, QCD jets are, you know, normal uh, width, so to speak. The other leptonic node that can be seen is uh, the two uh, heavy 
exist that decay to dimuon. Now, of course, the resolution is superb. Here's an example from 130 uh, GeV uh, decay to them for large tangent beta. This, what you see here, is a background from Drell Yang, so of course it's very, very high in this particular case. However, well, we can observe it, but of course it would be the sum of two peaks because the two are basically, essentially degenerate. So even though the delta M is of about 1%, in the example shown, the difference between the two is about 2 GB, so we cannot tell uh, which one is which. If you are to uh, look at the summary of this, here is mass A, and here is tangent beta. This region is excluded by lead. All this part of the plane is basically covered by these modes that I just showed you, which is Higgs decays into two tau and then either two jets or two leptons and so on. But basically you cover the entire plane via the tauonic modes. Uh, this is an example, uh, an attempt to combine the two experiments. So this is in the post lep 2000 era from the uh, combination of the four experiments. Excluded, this is what would be excluded from the tau mode and therefore it leaves now this hole where these modes cannot be observed. What about the charged one? Correspondingly, the charged Higgs would be here, for example, is produced in association with the top. The charged Higgs would go into a tau and the neutrino. And in fact, it is much like a W decaying into a lepton and the neutrino. So you can plot the transverse mass of the lepton and neutrino as if this were a W. And for high masses, you would see something like this. It's transverse mass of the tau jet with the missing energy. And you see something which is very separated from where the standard model would sit. This again has very high visibility over the part of the plane which is up here. Again, from here and to upwards, all of this is actually visible. Again, there's a hole at high MA and moderate tangent beta. And here's the soup. Here's now throwing every channel together. That is to say, you come in and now you add the H to gamma gamma. Here's the same uh, uh, plane as before. Again, the exclusion from left. The, the channels that are coming in from the right hand side are complementary. These are the channels coming this way, and these are now the bosonic ones. And of course, the most, the biggest one, the biggest contributor is a little h to gamma gamma. And you can extend that by adding the q cube h to tau tau, you come into here and you close the plane. So what this means is that over this mass range that before was not covered from the tauonic modes, you can see the little h, the little h. To compare this with, with the Tevatron experiments and where they run today, here is the uh, corresponding limit from uh, uh, the CDF and G0 prospects at 95% exclusion. So the best, with eight inverse femtobarns, or perhaps it's more reasonable to look at the four inverse femtobarn line, you have a tangent beta which can be probed up to values of 30, and this is 240. Now, to show you what a difference energy makes, the scale here is 240. The scale of 240 is right here for the corresponding plot for the LHC, and this now extends to 800. So over this mass range, the LHC basically brings you down, this however for discovery, not for exclusion, it would bring this reach down to the level of about 10, which is zero suppressed, this is 10, so the zero is right here. And then of course, this is the high masses that could be probed. So it represents a very, very significant here is the top level summary of the situation. What you have is excluded by lead, and then all of this part of the plane which is taken up by the tauonic modes, and then from the right hand side you come in and you set a limit that comes in from H to gamma gamma. In the absence of stop mixing, this line here, the, blue, the limit that comes from these guys comes all the way to the red, so you cover the full plane. With stop mixing, you pay a price and you come and you get pushed in here and you leave a hole. And the way you cover this hole and you come to here is by going to maximum luminosity. This is one of the arguments for needing a very high luminosity. But with maximum stop mixing and 300 inverse vector marks, you get that blue line and you bring it to the left, thus covering the entire plane. And here is the summary. This is a plane. This is tangent, uh, MA, tangent beta, 
And here's how many Higgs bosons one would observe in each and every part of the plane. Here are all the things to the tau modes that we can see. Uh, at, at low tangent betas uh, as well, um, you can observe a very large number of them. In fact, here, you can observe all five of them. You cannot disentangle the uh, A and the H, for example, because they're degenerate, but we see the decays of all of them. And then there's this particular region here, and close to this triangle, where only the little guy would be seen, and it would look like a standard mode case. This is sort of the scenario where Susie smells like the standard mode. So voila, this is basically the summary of the reach for the Higgs's. Um, do I have two more minutes? Two. Two. There's one very cool idea that uh, has come out of the Teletron from uh, Mike Alvaro et al., which is to try uh, diffractive Higgs production. That is to say, you, uh, you leave the two protons uh, unbroken, you tag them on both sides, you need Roman pots for that. And if you measure the momentum very accurately, you can just plot the missing momentum and not really rely on the decay products. So you would, uh, you would measure mh squared as basically the difference at the teratron is p and p bar, incoming minus outcoming. Um, now, the cross-section for this has been uh, disputed for, for a while. There's been measurements that have varied by up to two orders of magnitude. But of course, the advantage of something like this is that you would be facing a detector that has two hits in the forward direction. Essentially, nothing inside except for the decay products of the hits. That would be really beautiful if, if the cross-section for it is significant and if we can put a Roman box in forward direction. There's also, I don't want to give you a, a, a feeling that it's all said and done. There are some scenarios where, for example, the Higgs could go into the two neutralinos if it is allowed to go into chi 1, chi 1, more on this tomorrow. In that case, the decay here, so you have the W and Z that is produced, goes to the Higgs, but suppose that this guy can go into chi 1, chi 1, it just disappears. So none of the signatures that we referred to earlier are actually applicable. In that case, you will have to prove to the world that you have an excess of missing ET, and basically two forward jets from the QQ, and you'd have to convince them that this is actually the Higgs. That will be tough, and again, it will be only a counting experiment. And of course, there will be the problem of, if it's only missing ET, why is it not something else? This depends very much also on the backgrounds, because we have Z to go to that goes uh, Z jet jet, and the Z goes to two neutrinos. That would also give missing energy. There will be an issue of actually proving to the world that uh, uh, this is uh, the Higgs that goes into Taiwan. Well, I just wanted to mention it uh, just for completeness, but this is perhaps uh, the best summary to drop off with all the Higgs physics in the electric symmetry break. Tomorrow. We pick it up now with the Susie particles, other new physics. Thanks.